Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. I am beside myself with excitement and childlike glee because I get to come out here and share with you probably my absolute hands down favorite maker in the entire high end custom knife world and two of his absolutely outstanding creations. I'm going to be showing you the Phoenix and the Valera. Now, these are two entirely different knives, and I want to be very clear. These are not mine. The Phoenix was loaned in from a buddy. Thank you, Dylan Archer, for sharing your incredible knife with me. And it's funny because, I mean, he just got the knife. I don't think he even had it a week before he uh, sent it off to me. He had offered to send it to me before he even received it. And then I had reached out to Ron about some information on this knife. And he says, you know what? He goes, I've got something else that I just finished up for a customer. And I was wondering if maybe you'd like to take a look at it and maybe include it in with the Phoenix video. And I'm like, I'm not going to say no to that. When the man himself is kind enough to send one out to you, you're absolutely going to say yes. And I didn't know what it was going to be. I thought maybe it was going to be another Phoenix, maybe in a different execution of some sort. I wasn't really sure. And when I opened this and I saw that, and I saw the mammoth and the mother of pearl, I almost fell over. It is absolutely, and in every way, a signature look for Ron Best. It's that beauty of an art knife that he's so damn good at, and the overall aesthetic of a tactical style folder, which he has blended seamlessly over the past decade or so, once he kind of steered his ship in that direction, away from just doing art knives to doing artsy tactical knives. Everything he does is amazing. And I don't throw that word out there. I don't use that word lightly. When I say amazing, it truly is jaw-dropping, and you look at the execution, and you think of, number one, just the idea of putting these particular materials together. It takes an artist's mind to visualize how that's going to come out. But number two, the execution, the final finish, everything that's been done to these knives is that level of knife making that you rarely ever come across in at any point in your life, even if you're regularly going to blade shows and stuff like that, unless you stop at tables like, you know, Ron Best and Todd Bag and, and that ilk, then you're not experiencing the artistry that you're seeing on display here today. And that's why I have maintained for well over a decade here on this channel that Ron Best is one of my favorite makers, and I absolutely, before I die, will own one of his knives. And I tell you, after, after handling these, and handling the phase a decade ago, I was amazed. And it's not even to say that he's grown as a maker, because when you get to a certain level, when you get to what is can really be considered to be perfection, how do you get more perfecter than perfect? I, I don't really think that there is such a thing. But he has taken that same level of incredible detail and fit and finish and applied it into so many different materials here in front of me. Uh, titanium, zirconium, carbon fiber, mammoth ivory, damascene, steel, mother of pearl, so many things sitting here in front of me and made Every transition completely seamless. Let's take a good close look at both of these and prepare yourselves. This will be a fairly long video because I do want to show both in great detail. Let's take a look at these, analyze the work that went into them, and experience together what a true artist is able to accomplish. And please keep in the back of your mind at all times that Ron does not have a CNC. He uses for the most part, very basic tools and his hands. I believe the most advanced thing that he has in his shop is a pantograph. So when you realize that he's using a manual mill, his grinder, sandpaper, uh, I'm sure he's using die maker stones, the things that he's doing by hand or by hand on a machine is remarkable. To see the way that 
all of these things are fit together like a jigsaw puzzle without the use of a CNC is, is just, it's insane. And I have to think of, uh, I have to add more color to my vocabulary just to get this video done because it, these knives are that crazy. Anyway, I'm going to cut the intro short here. I'm sorry that already ran long, long enough. Let's take a good look at these knives and experience them together. Man, have you seen anything crazier on YouTube? Two Ron Best custom knives under one lens in the same place at the same time. It is absolutely one of those I need to pinch myself to make sure that I'm not dreaming kind of moments. Let's get that out of the way and I'm going to try to open up the Phoenix first. Yes, and that is what's inside. That is the Phoenix. Again, I want to give a huge shout out and mega thank you to my buddy Dylan Archer, who graciously allowed me to borrow this knife, and that's what kicked off this whole video. I had seen Ron make the post about this knife, that he was making it available for sale. What I can't remember is if it was an auction, or if it was a lottery, or, or what it was, and I saw that, and I had actually made a comment on that particular post basically just kind of genuflecting in front of him. <laughs> I get a message from Dylan, and he's one of those those cool online knife buddies that you spend, you know, probably 10 hours a week sharing memes back and forth in private message. So <laughs> it was surprising when I opened up a message from him and it wasn't a funny meme or commentary about some stupid story that I had posted on my Instagram. And he says, hey, do you want to check that knife out? I'm actually the guy that bought it. And without hesitation, I'm like, abso friggin -lutely. If you're cool with sending it once your honeymoon period is over, I would absolutely love the chance not only to bring it out here and review it and show it to my followers, but greedily, I wanted to play with it myself. I wanted to get my hands on it, feel it, experience it. And, and get a chance to see what this particular model is like. And he immediately sent it out. I don't even think he had this knife in his possession for a week. He had just gotten it, turned right around and sent it out to me. And I was amazed because if it was me and I was going to be generous enough to let somebody borrow one of my cool new toys, I'd want to have a little bit of time with it in the very beginning when it's the most exciting and he sent it right along. And then he messaged me not very long after. And he's like, don't even worry about getting it back to me in a hurry. Even if you've got it for months, totally cool. Enjoy it. Play with it. All that kind of good stuff. And of course, I'm not going to do that. That would just be awful. But what a wonderful, wonderful experience this has been. And I do want to kind of put this out there for everybody just to temper your expectations. This video is not about reviewing either knife. This is an overview. I'm going to share with you the, the beauty of the knives. I'm going to talk about how they were made. I'm going to talk about the maker a little bit. 
But when you're at this level of knife making, you people aren't reviewing your knives, which is to say they're not able to critique your knives. There aren't a list of pros and cons or areas of opportunity or anything else on these knives. They are literal, flawless perfection, and there's nothing to pick apart. So what I'm going to be doing basically is just showcasing these knives. And I love being able to do this particularly with a knife borrowed from a viewer or friend or follower because it helps people understand while they're watching this that there is no shilling for the maker or brand. There is no financial kickback of any sort. I don't get to keep the knife. This is not my knife. Neither is the Valera. And I don't make money for doing this, except for when you guys are kind enough to subscribe and like videos and share them where other people get to see them. And then I get a teeny tiny little bit from YouTube monetization that is, when they decide not to demonetize one of my videos. Anyway, so to quickly go through this, I'm not going to be rattling off a bunch of specs and uh, critiquing it. It's just showing you the beauty of the build. I'm going to start off right here with the engravings inside. They're individually engraved. Shows that this was made by Ron Best. It was done on, oh my God, on my birthday? Really? Dylan, if you ever sell this knife, you need to sell it to me, period. Uh, it, was, it was born on January 30th, 2024. What a crazy, crazy coincidence. And uh, there is the centering. Like, why would I even bother to show you the centering or the lockup? I mean, this is very clearly made by one of the best knife makers in the world. One of the things that I found interesting, uh, number one, this thing is a huge fingerprint magnet. One of the things that I found interesting about this was the changes in the finish and tones as well as the elevation changes. Now, that's something that doesn't really come across in pictures or really have to see it being moved around to really understand this. Because here, while there is an elevation difference, it's not major, and then it drops off way over here. So the way I see it, and I, I, I could very easily be wrong, but it, it appears to me and I say that it could be, I could be wrong because when Ron Best does inlays, the inlays are absolutely seamless and you could very easily mistake that for one piece of material. When I look at this, I think that this is, let's look at this side here, the presentation side, is one piece of titanium that he has then milled down to create this pattern. And this raised area here, is still the same piece of titanium. It's just left not milled. It's it's obviously a lot thicker and then perfectly polished and then inlaid with these uh, gorgeous marbled carbon fiber inlays. And it's funny because I have used this exact material. I double checked with Ron where he got the material and I actually have used this exact same material. However, I had never considered polishing it, especially not to this degree. So when I worked with it, it would have been much more matte looking with just uh, pops of shiny areas, I suppose is the best way to put it. But I mean, his polishing is just so, so gorgeous. So yeah, I would look at this as that being one thick piece of titanium that was then milled down to this, all that is a very rough bead blast. It gives you a dark finish. All this is mirror polished and beautifully done, I might add. And then he's mirror polished all the perimeter edges going all the way around. Look at the backspacer. Look at the level of detail just in this backspacer. 
Now, as I understand it, that is actually going to be red ceramic in there. So a Cerakote uh, put into the jimping of the backspacer. Which this kind of reminds me of like a hypercar, like you'd be looking at like a Bugatti or maybe like the, the Ford GT with its flying buttresses. Seeing that, ar not, not really arch, but this kind of bridge over the cutout frame and then the, the window all the way through it. And then just to make sure it's not boring, you know, let's, uh, let's put an inlay in there and let's put an inlay in here. And then once again, so perfectly matched that you almost don't even know that they're there. I thought the pocket clip was very interesting. Here is a super slick way to design your pocket clip where it falls into the overall design of the knife so well that in the right lighting or at the right angle, you can't even tell there's a pocket clip on here. It flows perfectly with the overall design of the knife and it's just gorgeous. Notice also that there is no external hardware. Yes, you have the pivot, but that being done so decoratively, I don't even want to really consider that a piece of hardware, even though technically it is. You have no way to look at this externally and see how the knife was assembled. It's like a jigsaw puzzle of dark and rough and polished and smooth areas. Your materials here are titanium, zirconium, carbon fiber. And it's just, it's, it's really a beauty in the hand. Oh, yeah, and let's not forget the Damasteel. I don't know how I forgot to mention Damasteel in that list. And yeah, the camera struggles to focus because this is all mirror polished on the blade and you've got all these mirror polished highlights that the, uh, the, the camera definitely doesn't understand what it's focusing on. The action, as you would expect, is flawless. It's got a nice detent without being super strong. It's not a finger breaker at all. And because of the way that this has been sculpted, I've got areas to put my fingers to kind of get a good hold on it as I'm flipping the knife open, accessing the flipper tab. I love the fact that he skeletonized the flipper tab as if to say, hey, I've done so much on this knife to keep it from being boring. I don't want just a regular old flipper tab sticking up out of there. I've got to do something special. And... While that is clearly not needed, that is exactly what he's done. Another indication of the level of perfection that Ron works at. The jimping I do want to make mention of because the jimping is fantastic. It feels really, really good, but it's only grippy when you're pushing into it, which is the way jimping should be. You shouldn't feel like it's tearing you up if you run your thumb across it, but if you push into it, applying pressure as if you're working with it, then it should definitely grab your skin, and it does. I particularly love this lock. So you've got an inset tab lock that is done, it looks like, in titanium with a zirconium end piece, and then the steel lock insert so that it's got a steel-on-steel -steel interface at the lock. I mean, wow, what attention to detail. So a subframe lock or, a, or an inset tab lock that has at least, it lo looks like to me one, two, three individual components put together seamlessly. You can't feel them. He has scalloped away the area to relieve inside of the, the lock area so that you're able to drop your thumb in there easily. And another thing I love is everything is very slender and sleek and aggressively designed. It just looks sharp sitting there. It looks sharp and it looks mean. Now, let's add in the Valera. We'll look at them side by side for a minute, then we'll focus solely on the Valera. As if by magic, the Valera appears. And again, wow is really the only word I can come up with. 
When you look at these side by side, you see how dramatically different they are. This is very, very sleek and slender. This is a little bit fatter, but both follow a very organic design flow. And that's another thing that I like about Ron's designs. They tend to be more organic than geometric. And that's not to say that I don't appreciate makers that do geometric type of designs, but there's something beautiful about how everything flows. And again, there's no way to nitpick these knives. They're either going to be your taste or not, but as far as the workmanship, they're perfection. The only thing I could see anybody critiquing about this is if they didn't like the look of this kind of heavy dual bolster. So you've got this very large bolster up at the top of the frame, and that Flipper tab is all the way at the top of it, forcing you to reach a little bit. I mean, if you wanted to, you could probably thumb flick it like that. Now, I'm doing that only because I am over a very soft surface. I know that this looks like marble or stone, but it's not. It's very, very soft and gentle. I wouldn't stand over like a sidewalk and do this because you don't have a very secure hold on the knife as you're trying to do that. You do, however, when you do it with your index finger. And it's so easy to grab the flipper tab because, well, the jimping is super nice and sharp. Very, very easy to access. And again, my camera is going to struggle here to focus. Now let's talk again about materials and the wonderful artistic choices that were made. The frame, judging by the weight, I'm going to say it's mirror polished titanium. Uh, it feels too lightweight to be mirror polished steel. But again, if this was made 30 years ago, it would have been very popular for an art knife maker to have used stainless steel. But, you know, we live in a different era now and uh, titanium really is the king when it comes to making high-end knives. And then we look at the backspacer here, and I have a little piece of fuzz. I apologize. I've been using a yellow cloth to kind of wipe things down. I'm going to pull that out later and uh, be very, very gentle about it. There are the inlays using Mother of Pearl. This would be presentation-grade Mother of Pearl, I would assume. Now, the only difference between presentation-grade and... Um, like a gray double A mother of pearl is presentation grade would actually look this beautiful and clean and smooth on both sides of the material. And it's not really necessary because you're only going to see one side, but I have a funny feeling he spends the extra money to get the presentation grade because, well, you know, it's like when you buy a Rolex, whether you like Rolex or not, you, you can't deny the fact that they use the best materials. Yes, they're overhyped. Yes, the prices get inflated unnaturally because every year Rolex charges 10 to 15% more on their retail, which makes all the ones that are already out there worth more money just because they're raising the prices. But when you buy a Rolex, let's say you even buy just like a Submariner, you buy a sport watch, your hands are solid 18 karat white gold. It's not necessary to use solid white gold for the hands. They could use any kind of metal that will polish and it will look just fine, just like everybody else does. When you buy a, a sport model in an Omega, they're not solid gold hands. They would be in a dress model. But they're doing it because, well, they can. They're going to use the best materials no matter what design they're doing. And that's the same reason they use 904 steel instead of 316L, which would be the popular choice. Just because they could say, well, you could drop your watch into a vat of acid and it's not going to disintegrate. Nobody's ever going to do that, but they can make that claim honestly and say, we use the best, most anti-corrosive steel that exists. We don't need to, but we do. So that's why I'm making that assumption about the, uh, the mother of pearl. And then you have a nice little button of mother of pearl in the center of this mammoth ivory. So yes, for those that are new to knives or are not into knives at all, 
that is actually ivory from a woolly mammoth. So hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. It's also extremely brittle. I've worked with mammoth only a few times, and it is one of the scariest materials. By the way, also, so is Mother of Pearl. Both of these materials are very scary to cut, to grind, to do anything with, because they can chip out extraordinarily easily at any stage, from the very first time you touch it till the very last second. Like when he goes to inlay that Mother of Pearl into this mammoth, it could have very easily chipped because you see how how precise that is. That is that mother of pearl is cut to almost the exact same size as the hole in the uh, the mammoth ivory. It could have very easily chipped off a piece of that mother of pearl. Then you start from scratch and make another one. So yeah, both the mammoth as well as the uh, Mother of Pearl. Very, very difficult to work with. Very easy to damage. And he's done an exceptional job. Look at all the risks he took to make sure that this is radius, the exact same radius as the titanium bolster. And then the Damasteel bolster radius to match the titanium and they're both polished perfectly and unless you're looking at the outside edges you can't see where the damasteel ends and the titanium begins except for the lack of pattern and the the persistence of pattern i suppose you could say all of this is perfectly finished in every conceivable way and it feels amazing now these are all very very expensive materials that are being used and a lot of time going into them because again i have to remind you because when you look at this level of detail all of the work that's been done here you look at it and go well yeah his, he's a really good cnc operator he is not he does not have a cnc both of these knives were made in that exact same manner. What you're looking at here, I did ask Dylan what the value is on that. That was in the low 5000s I believe you said $51 or $5,200. And the Valera right here starts at about $6,500. Now, I know a lot of people are grasping at their chest right now, trying desperately to get a breath of air because that's a lot of money for a pocket knife. It really is. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that that's not a lot of money. However, when you realize that each of these individual knives represents weeks, perhaps even months, I don't know, of Ron's time in the shop, away from his friends, away from his family, away from his hobbies, away from everything, that this is a time capsule, a moment in time of Ron Best's life. I don't know how many knives Ron is able to crank out per year, but I'm going to assume it's not that many. Now, typically, you would say uh, about Ron and about all makers in Ron's level that his books are closed, and currently they are. However, I asked him, and he said in about a month, he's hoping to reopen his books. So if you are a high-end collector, maybe you're that kind of guy that buys a Cabot 1911 instead of going out and just buying a Staccato. This is the level of knife that goes with the level of uh, handguns that you're accustomed to. Getting on his books is something that you should probably prioritize because this is right up your alley. And I promise you, there are men watching right now that are much more Springfield prodigy people over a Staccato. And they go, you're insane for spending $2,500, $3,500, $4,500 on a staccato when my prodigy does the same thing. No, it doesn't. And it's not nearly as refined. And if you don't understand the differences and the nuances between them, then that would have been wasted on you anyway. And then there's that level that goes, hey, man, staccatos are really great. 
But they're definitely, and exactly how Staccato defines their brand, they are a duty and EDC manufacturer now. They are not custom guns, and they are not made for competition anymore, like when STI was STI. There's a marked difference between that Staccato and a, let's say, a Cabot or a Nighthawk Custom. Yeah, now you're going to get up into 6000 or you're going to get into... $8,000, $10,000 and more. And sure, a lot of guys could never justify that. And I understand that. There are different levels for different levels of collectors and users and whatever else you want to classify yourself as. And to give you a good example, because this is the only time I'm going to have all three of these knives here at the same time, which is why I'm doing this. Okay, remember I said around 5100 or 5200 the valera starts around 6500 guess what the value is on this todd rexford that is not polished that does not have any exotic materials this is literally only titanium that is a $28,000 knife which will yes be getting its own video very very shortly so when you put it in that perspective if you like exotic materials, if you like a more dressy, elegant approach, because this, while it's absolutely gorgeous and groundbreaking in the way that it was made, it's not as flashy as the knife that's sitting right next to it. If you appreciate the more artsy look of the Valera, you look at that and go, that's an exceptional value. Now, would I personally pay $28,000 for this knife? No. I don't feel the value is quite that high. It's a jaw-dropping knife in every possible way. However, I can look at this and go, well, hell, for five, or sorry, for six grand, I'd honestly rather have this because I think it's more beautiful. It's more elegant. It probably took just as much time to make. I know that sounds crazy because you're going, this is only just titanium. When I do the full review on this, you'll understand what it is that I mean. I would personally rather put the money into this. Or more realistically, the Phoenix. The Phoenix is more my speed. It's more, I don't know, it's more aggressive looking. It's more badass, futuristic kind of uh, look that I am very, very much into. I'd be happy with either one, especially with the materials that were chosen on that build with the Mammoth and Mother of Pearl. What a great combination. And with it being cross-cut Mammoth, you've got this kind of starburst pattern that comes out of it that makes it wonderfully unique. Just, I mean, just gorgeous, man. The cross-cut mammoth where you're seeing the center and going out to the outside edges, that explosion of elegance. It's radiant, it's beautiful, and it's one of a kind. It could never be replicated ever because no two pieces are going to be the same. They're just flawless. So anyway, that is the look at the Ron Best Valera and the Ron Best Phoenix. Now, I had said, I guess it's been about a decade now since I did the phase, the Ron Best phase video. And I said at that point, I'm going to have one of these. This is my goal. I might have changed that now to a Phoenix. Now, he's been making the Phoenix for a while now, so I don't know how much longer he's going to offer them. I just got to hope that maybe I hit the lottery between now and then. And Ron is just one of the nicest, coolest dudes. I've had the opportunity to, to sit down and, and, and talk with him. He's just one of those guys that you really enjoy talking to. He's got a wonderful attitude. He's extremely humble. I could tell you right now he's watching this video and hearing me say all these fluffy things about him and it's probably making him cringe because he's just not 
that kind of egotistical person. But he's got a great attitude about knife making. He's got a great attitude in general. So, yeah, it's it's my honor to come out here and uh, play with these on camera for you and share them with you. And hopefully the takeaway for you is not just, oh my God, knives can be expensive. But the takeaway is hopefully when I spend a good amount of money on a knife, I'm not just going to be paying for fancy materials or the name of the person that's making it. Even though, yes, you are, you're buying into their, their legacy and their reputation, but I'm buying for an incredible degree of work that results in something that is such a high level that I'll never find anything that compares. That's the way you should be looking at it. When you hear people talk about grail knives, and you'll see the topic come up all the time in these Facebook knife groups. Somebody will make a, 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 a thread and go, hey, what, what, what grail knives do you have on your list? And people will actually list $150 Kershaw's or $500 Hinderers. And it, it, it hurts my soul. And people can defend it and go, well, you know, a grail means different things to different people, or there's there's a different bar. No, there isn't. A grail is inaccessible. It is either due to its rarity and exclusivity or due to its cost. But it is unlikely that you will ever own that thing. That's why it's called a grail, because you're chasing after it for seemingly forever, and you will most likely never get it. Because the phrase was coined after the Holy Grail, the unobtainable thing. If you're not religious, then fine. You don't need to, we don't need to go into all that. But it is unlikely that it will ever be unearthed. There is one. So there's your scarcity. No amount of money is going to put that in your home. You can't pay an expedition team $150 billion to go find it because they still can't do it no matter how much money you have. That's the idea behind a grail knife. It's something that maybe, maybe before you die, the something crazy will happen and the stars will align and either it will be available and you can't afford it or it'll be available and you can afford it. Somehow you hit the lottery or something then your grail is obtainable. Otherwise, it's a grail. It's something that you will hope for and wish for, but never have. So yes, the term is often misused, but when you're handling a Ron Best, I can tell you that is, these are both grails. They're so scarce and they're so special and they are expensive. They're way out of the league for most people. And they're only within reach of a few people. And even those few people, when they have the money, a lot of times they could reach out to Ron and go, hey, I really, really want a knife. He's going to go, sorry, my books are closed for at least the next year or two. Then what do you do? It is unobtainium. It is that grail. So there it is. Grail properly defined and embodied in these two knives. That's all I've got to say about that. I'm out of here for now, and I'll see you guys on the next video.